Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As you will have seen from last night, I do have a series of important messages to share with you today. Our Director of Public Health is, is here with us on, um, in person, and the Minister for Health and Social Care is on Zoom, as um, will be joining us on Zoom. On Sunday, I spoke to you all about the uncertainty that remained around two unexplained cases. I have to tell you now that over the course of the day yesterday, we have had further cases that have caused us concern. The Council of Ministers met on a number of occasions throughout Monday to review the evidence as it developed and to ensure we had plans ready should the position deteriorate further. Over Sunday evening and into Monday, we saw another two separate cases. As contact tracing developed, there was some information that may have linked them. This would have given us a better understanding of the source. And then yesterday evening, we saw a further two cases identified where the source is not known. One of these, as I'm sure you will have seen, is in a school setting. We received confirmation of this late last night, and the Council of Ministers immediately held an emergency meeting in response to this. There is, of course, still a great deal that we don't know. But what is clear is that, as we said on Sunday, there is transmission in our community that we cannot see and that we do not understand. We can now see that it is not an isolated couple of cases, but more widespread. And this concerns us for a number of reasons. It concerns us because our hospital is still facing winter challenges and has very little spare capacity at the moment. It concerns us because we want, no we want nothing to jeopardise our vaccination programme that is about to enter a new phase with significant supplies due to arrive onto the island throughout this month. It concerns us because we have seen what has happened elsewhere when community transmission is left unchecked. I would also stress that we are very mindful of the significant cost to any form of circuit break lockdown. I do not just mean the obvious financial and economic costs, but the human, health and welfare costs. At this point, I'd like to hand over to Dr Hewitt to give you an update on the current position as it has developed. Dr Hewitt. Thank you. Um, I want to talk really about the change from believing that we were dealing with one controllable cluster to the shift that we now have to understanding <clears throat> that we clearly do have wider community transmission. So if we go back till Friday, until Friday, although we were seeing um, a steady increase in cases, all of those were related to high-risk contacts of cases already known to be linked to the current cluster. The two cases that emerged on Friday evening couldn't be so linked, but in both those cases, apart from household contacts, other wider contacts had been really quite limited apart from a few low-risk locations of interest. So again, although we couldn't tie those cases definitively, well, at all, back to the cluster, there was a lower level of concern about the wider implication for onward transmission. Uh, things then began to change on Sunday with the identification of a third community case which didn't link to either of the two others or to the cluster. Then on Monday we identified a close contact of that case but at that point um, there was evidence to indicate that that in fact might give us a link back to a venue associated with the cluster. So it was really not until last night and the emergence of two further completely unrelated cases that the level of concern and the level of risk definitively rose. And in that case, those two additional cases have confirmed considerable spread in terms of geography um, and also in terms of the different demographics of the case individuals involved. The timing still makes it likely that they are in fact linked to the cluster, um, but whether we will ever be able to definitively understand the missing links, that is the people through whom transmission must have happened to take it to where it's got now, uh, we may never know. So clearly we will still be following all the usual best practice for contact tracing, but there is a much wider community spread issue out there now which we need to respond to. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hewitt. 
On current projections, we hope that we will have given a first dose to all our priority groups, so all over 50s and all adults who are clinically vulnerable during April. If we were facing the same situation in a month's time, then perhaps the outcome might be different. We hope that progress on our vaccination programme will continue to build our defences and mean that we, that we do not need circuit breakers in the future. We know that there is a moment where we will be able and will need to move from a policy of local elimination to one where we live with the virus. The situation around us beyond our shores is changing fast and we are not a million miles away from that point. But equally, no one around the world is saying they are quite ready at that point yet. Later this week we will be publishing our medium term approach for returning to a more normal situation with our borders and that longer term outcome has to be the ultimate goal that we focus on. We had hoped to publish it earlier but obviously events have unfolded at pace. So in the future our approach may be different but we are not there yet and we need to act now in a way that we know works. If we allow our health and care services and vaccination programme to be destabilised, then that plan might get derailed or delayed. That is why we tried so hard to wait to have more information and ensure our response was proportionate. Late last night, we decided that we do now need to act. After lengthy discussions that weighed heavily on our minds, we have decided that we cannot allow anything to put this longer term exit at risk. We need to intervene now. If we do, if we do so now, and if everything, everyone does their bit, we will stamp out the current outbreak that seems to be moving under the surface of our community. Once we get into the future and our most vulnerable are protected, we may be able to take things differently. But right now, we need to eliminate this outbreak. We do not want to be in and out of lockdowns and circuit breaks. We have gone in hard and fast and this has worked. We decided that we want to do the same again. We have therefore decided that we will be heading into a further circuit break from one minute past midnight tonight. So for clarity, the first minute of Wednesday, we will be putting in place and legalizing for a set of clear measures. We will be doing this as we did the last time for a period of 21 days. We will review this constantly and as before, we will only keep measures in place for as long as we judge them necessary. If we can adjust them earlier, we will. If we have to extend, we will. This time, as well as the number of active cases, progress in the uh, vaccination programme will be also an important factor for us. The measures will be similar to what we had in the last circuit break. It worked last time and we have every reason to believe it will work once again. These measures will come into force from the first minute of Wednesday, but I would encourage everyone to start immediately if possible. Let me take you through what we have decided. It is broadly where we were in January. We need you to stay at home. There are only a few exceptions to this for essential things like getting food, daily exercise or work if you really cannot work from home. You can also leave home, of course, if you are going for a medical appointment or to be vaccinated or tested. We will be implementing social distancing measures, so two metres, in all settings where it is possible to do so. If you do go outside, we strongly advise you to wear face coverings as much as you possibly can. We will again insist on this on public transport. If you go outside to exercise, please do so in a way that is safe Keep your distance, respect others and avoid crowds. We need you all to, to stop all household mixing. This is absolutely key to stopping the spread. All hospitality and leisure venues will need to close, as last time they will be able to offer takeaway and delivery services, but no eating in. All non-essential retail must close to the public, as last time. They can offer delivery and click and collect services, we will again allow building suppliers to open for trades, but not to the general public. All lifestyle businesses, hairdressers for example, must close. From tomorrow morning, schools will close to the majority of pupils and the online learning, which worked well in January, will recommence.
the schools and their ex existing settings will only be open to children of essential workers and to vulnerable children who need it. If parents are able to work from home and keep their children at home, it is essential that they do so as numbers are limited. We are keeping the schools in their existing places this time rather than consolidating in hubs based on feedback the department received. This is to give a better, more local service to those who really need it, vulnerable children and those of essential workers, but it is just for those who do. Parents are asked where possible to keep their children at home as space is limited. In line with the third week of our last circuit break, we will not be stopping the construction or other related trades where they are outside or on vacant properties. We will, however, require them to fully practice social distancing and other mitigations and they will not be able to enter any households unless for emergency repairs. Allowing these trades to continue is based on feedback from last time and taking on feedback is something we have committed to do every time we have to step into difficult positions such as this. Everyone who can work from home must do so. We need businesses to support their employees on this as they did before and ensure that they have only staff who are absolutely essential to be on site. Let me again thank everyone, including all of those local businesses who took responsible action over the weekend. We appreciate what you did and as we have said before, where we make decisions that impact you, we will be there to support you. From Wednesday, we will be reactivating the financial support measures, including MIRA, salary support and the business support scheme. The Treasury Minister will provide a statement in the House of Keys later today. I know this will be far from easy this time for so many. I know there is a great cost in locking down our island and our lives, but we believe the alternative is now even more costly. I know we have asked you so much in the past and I know we are asking you so much again, and I am truly sorry that this is happening. But our collective judgment throughout yesterday and last night, as more information became clearer, was that this is what we need to do. I have always said that we will do what is right for the island, and this is what we are doing, the right thing. Talking about doing the right thing, I have been asked why we did not say something at 7 o'clock this morning. There was a risk identified late last night that had to be dealt with first, which was specific advice to Year 8 at Bemmer Hague School. If we had told people at 7am this morning not to go to work or school without any time for companies or individuals to pre prepare for what could have been a three-week period, then businesses and parents could justifiably criticise government for not allowing sufficient time in which to prepare and for businesses to continue to operate within the new rules. In truth, what we would have seen is thousands of people having to come into work anyway in order to prepare for what we are asking them to do. It is recognising the importance of the issue that we are having this conversation now rather than our usual time. People will have the remainder of the day to prepare and position themselves properly for the next three weeks. And just before we go to questions, I'd also like to point out that the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture, Dr Allenson, is also on Zoom to ask any questions you may have. And first and foremost, we have Simon Richardson from Business 365. Good morning, Simon. Moramai. Good morning, Chief Minister. I suppose the overriding feeling is here we go again. But I also feel the burning question on many people's lips is why wasn't stronger action taken on Saturday? Now, you asked people to stay at home. You didn't order them to. Uh, a lot of people didn't hear the advice, heed the advice, and they went to pubs, attended parties, etc. In effect, we allowed, a, I suppose, a virtual mini Cheltenham races scenario to develop. Now, I acknowledge hindsight is a wonderful thing, but we now face a potentially serious outbreak that might have been curbed at the weekend. Well, at the time we asked, we, we couldn't legislate at the drop of a hat. We asked people to be responsible and not to go out. And I'm glad to say the vast majority of people did stay at home. Large events such as charity balls, um, 
Douglas Corporation, I think, had an event. And all these were cancelled. So an awful lot of events were cancelled. The vast majority, yes, there was a small minority of people who chose to not respect the advice that we were giving, but at least we did manage to uh, avert an awful lot of gatherings. Obviously, we were waiting for more information. Um, had we... We, we had tested the high-risk contacts and we were waiting for that to come back to see if they had the um, virus. You know, over the weekend it became apparent that they didn't have the virus and, and therefore, as a result, we thought we had it under control. But Dr Ewart, you might want to expand on that. Thank you, Chief Minister. I think that's right. It's always a very, very difficult call to make. And as I explained when I was uh, going through the timeline of the gradual addition of these unexplained cases. The two that we knew about Friday evening into Saturday had not been out and about very widely at all, which actually enabled us to take a call that from those cases there was little evidence of high likelihood. They hadn't been out in pubs and clubs, they hadn't been to parties or events. So we were able to take that middling view. As the Chief Minister has said, you can't just switch restrictions on and off. There is a process to go through in order to make them legal. So on the basis of the information that we had at the time, going for that call of putting out an advisory and an information um, approach appeared to be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question, Simon. Well, obviously, we're now in a situation where we could have different mutations in the community. Now, which brings us back to a topic that has been regularly aired at the briefings, um, and that's the matter of testing and the breakdown in the relationship between the department and Dr. Glover and her company, uh, Taxogenomics. That means, in effect, we don't have real time genomics to respond to cluster cases and identify in rapid time these specific mutations we're dealing with. Now, Dr. Glover says that the whole argument comes down to a biomedical scientist copying her company's software. Now, she's said that she's prepared to put the dispute to one side and work uh, collaboratively with government. So in view of what we're facing now, um, why isn't this happening? Uh, her argument obviously is that we need to break transmission chains and not hope they just burn out. Right, well, I'll ask Dr. Hewitt to come in on that and then the health minister may want to add something. Firstly, genomic sequencing doesn't help us break transmission. We do that by using all the usual methods of epidemiology and contact tracing to identify persons, times and places, test for whether they're positive, self-isolate. In fact, knowing the genomic sequence makes no difference to that immediate response. Certainly from an epidemiological point of view, it is extremely interesting to be able to understand where lines of transmission have come from. And you'll remember the cluster we had um, immediately after the new year. Initially, we thought there were two cases there, I think possibly at 1.3, that couldn't be linked back to that cluster on the basis of the information people had provided to us. The genomic sequencing indicated that they did all relate to one travel-related event, so they were the same cluster, and that led to further contact tracing, which nudged people's memories, if you like, and enabled us to fill in the missing pieces. With much wider community transmission and the issue of, as I've expressed it, the missing links, that's the areas of moorland where there was no fire, but where fire might well have been passing under the peat layers. Because of the time course, we're never going to be able to get positive samples on people, even if we could identify who they possibly might have been, and therefore there won't be any genomic sequencing. We know that all the cases we've seen on island since mid-January, that includes cases within the current cluster and other unrelated travellers coming across and being tested in the usual way. We know that they're all Kent variant. We also know we have other travellers who have opted for 21 days self-isolation and no testing, so we will never know whether they were positive and if so, what variant they might have been. So the real-time benefit of variant testing to my mind, does not impact on our acute response. Thank you. Thank you. And David, would you like to um, comment on anything? 
Uh, yes, thank you, Chief Minister. Can I first of all say, Simon, obviously, as Minister, I can't comment quite rightly on anything that either is subject to or may be subject to any form of legal action. Um, in relation to genomic sequence, and the Director of Public Health has covered it off very well there, it's very good at looking backwards, genomic sequencing, and it does have a role to play, um, but it is not the time sense to roll. Dr. Glover quite rightly says what we need to do is cut chains of transmission. And what does that is contact tracing. Our contact tracing team looking at those cases that have tested positive and then isolating those high risk contacts around people. That is what makes the difference. And that's what stops a widespread outbreak. Genomic sequencing plays its part, but it is not as time sensitive as the contact tracing. And can I just say the relationship between DHSC and Dr. Glover has nothing to do with the genomic sequencing. We have always used the Liverpool facility for genomic sequencing. We've never used Dr. Glover, um, even when she was contracted to the department. Um, and the situation has not changed. We have access to a world-class facility in Liverpool that gives us access to wider data and builds us into the wider understanding of COVID-19. It's used by multiple countries around the world. It's overseen by three world-class professors. And we should be very, very thankful, actually, as an island, that we have access to that kind of facility at no cost to the Manx taxpayer. Thank you very much for that, David, and, and thank you very much, Simon. Now we move on to Sam Turton from Jeff. Good, good morning, Sam. Mora I keep on wanting to say faster, my, but it's Mora Mai. Mora Mai, Chief Minister. Um, it seems that since the weekend, we all knew where this was going. In fair enough, you had issued the advice on Saturday, but then on Sunday, we said there was no restrictions and the pubs reopened and everyone went back to school and everyone went back to work. Can I just ask, was it to not go to a lockdown at the weekend, purely a medical one, or was there a division politically in terms of the council ministers on whether or not we should enter a lockdown? No, th there was no divisions, um, Sam. What we were facing was the fact that we'd had two cases. We um, obviously didn't know where they'd come from, but we did, we did the testing straight away on um, their close contacts and on the Saturday, on Sunday, we got the, the evidence that they did not have the vaccine and therefore they hadn't been spreading it around the community. So we've always said just when you get one or two cases, we were never going to lock the island down and we had clearly seen that on Sunday, the um, close contacts were not high risk, they weren't um, shedding in the community and therefore we had hoped that that um, element had been put to bed um, and that's why we, we felt the need that, that we were able to open up again. I don't know, Dr. Ewart, if you want to expand on that. Yes, Chief Minister, thank you. I, th I think that's absolutely fair comment. Um, lockdown has huge implications on a, a whole range of fronts. It's not something to be undertaken lightly. And one has to therefore take a call as public health and contact tracing on whether we still consider that the cases are containable through contact tracing, self-isolation, wider testing, or whether there is an indication to go for an island-wide um, change in level of response. And on what we had available to us over the weekend, uh, we were not recommending that we should escalate um, a lockdown response. Yeah, I'd just like to give a, a little bit of a, um, a, a time frame, Sam, just, just to help you. We, we became aware, I became aware at about quarter past eight last night that we had two unexplained cases. Before then, we'd been looking at um, four cases, but we thought there might have been a link and that was being tested um, as the time went by. However, at 8.15, it became aware that we had two further cases, which we didn't believe were, were linked to any other cases or we, we didn't know at the time. I immediately called a Council of Ministers meeting at nine o'clock and at 10 o'clock, we started uh, contacting the, the, the school that was involved and started to put things in place. So we have moved really quickly on this once we realised it was a situation that we didn't feel that we could control. I don't know, David, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I, I mean, we moved as fast as we could with it, Sam, as the Chief Minister's laid out the timeline there. Council, meet, Council of Ministers was meeting late into the night to discuss this. We had to draw proposals that we wish to move forward with. They were agreed, um, they had to be agreed as well. But I think also the other important point to make is that there is always with COVID a time delay in the fact that people tend to present symptoms generally four to five days. 
um, after they've actually developed COVID. And so it is highly likely that the chains of transmission and people's infection occurred prior to Saturday. OK, thanks, Sam. Thank you. And just secondly, um, in t Public Health England have put out information relating to vaccines and the efficiency of both vaccines that we're using on the island, saying that a first dose can give up to 80% protection in the over 80s. People are asking us, given that you've already said we're expecting a big influx of vaccines on the island this month, why are we not stepping up with the first doses now, relying on that we know there are more coming in quicker than there would have been? Thanks, Sam. And um, David, I think you, you can give a far more detailed answer than I can on that. Obviously, we've always known we were getting these increased numbers, but we've now got additional ones we've just found out. But David, if you'd like to give a full detailed answer. Yeah, I certainly would, Chief Minister. And the answer is we are stepping up the first dose, as Sam. Um, I explained this at a briefing previously. Um, it doesn't actually make much change to our rollout in terms of the figures. I think I said it makes two weeks difference. And that is why I announced the other day that we expect now to have all the over 50s with their first dose of vaccine done in April rather than in May, which was the original schedule. Um, and actually, we will actually we will have done the doses for the over 50s on exactly the same same time scale that the UK is laying out because again we have to remember about language the UK is using the language of inviting people for a vaccine that doesn't mean people have actually had the vaccine the UK deadline for everyone over the age of 50 and in the vulnerable category to be done is around mid-April and that is exactly the same as ours is but just in terms of that it's impossible to go quicker now that we do know we have more coming in isn't is it not possible to speed up it even quicker the uh, island's vaccination programme? Once we receive the vaccine, we may well be able to do that. And I may well in a couple of weeks be announcing um, that the date has moved forward again. We don't yet know, as I explained at the previous briefing, what the numbers will actually be in terms of the additional vaccine supply we will get. So it is important we see what comes on Ireland. And once we know what that additional supply is, hopefully I will be able to announce positive news that the date might move forward again. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sam. Now we move on to Paul Moulton, Isle of Man Television. Good morning, Paul. Moromai. Good morning, uh, Chief Minister. I, I need to go back to the timeline last night and the, the very late press release. Um, I think it's the number one question that uh, I've been asked so many times last night was, could you not have just made some of these announcements there and then in the press release? For instance, the lockdown was going to happen. Children have gone to school today, yet now you're saying they're not going to go back tomorrow. And in fact, the uh, education minister was on the radio past eight saying it was voluntary today to go to school. This seems yet again, and you know I keep asking it, it seems communication hasn't been your finest point on this. Well, well, I suppose we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't, Paul. We finished our meeting at gone 10 o'clock last night. We obviously had to focus on speaking with the head teacher of the school involved to make sure that we could put procedures in place as quickly as possible so the school didn't wake up in the morning, even at seven o'clock, to um, find out they had a problem. That was being worked on. And we put a press release out straight away to all Timble members and then obviously on to the media outlets saying that we were going to be making an announcement. Now, it's important that we give, and we've done this before, if, if, if you look at the lockdown in January, for example, I think at lunchtime on, on um, the, the 5th Tuesday, I said we were going to be closing schools on the Thursday. So we didn't do it straight away. It's not the sort of thing you do because our young people need to go into school to get their IT equipment so that they can work from home. And also parents who may have businesses that need to put their business in order um, need the day to um, put the kids into school so they can go and get short of supplies, etc., turn their business from maybe um, inward facing to outward facing if they're going to be doing deliveries, etc. They need time. This is what we found out from the last time. It's no different than the last time. In fact, it's probably slightly quicker that we've, we've announced it. I think given the magnitude of what we are announcing today, it's important that I do it face to face with people rather than putting it in a, a detailed press release. And, you know, if I give you an example, in the United Kingdom, you, you get a little leak that the Prime Minister is going to give a press statement at six, seven o'clock in the evening, and that can be 24 hours in advance. We put out a notice late last night, the minute we'd finished the Council of Ministers, I think it went out about 11 o'clock to you all, or circa that time, and that I'd be doing something first thing in the morning. And um, here we are, 
and and that's what we're doing. We, we, there are so many variants, Paul, and I, and I appreciate some people will say, oh, you should have done it earlier. Some people will be happy with what we've done. We're damned if we do, damned if we don't. We, we've been pretty quick off the mark when you consider it was only late evening last night that we found out about these two cases, and we, we moved, except, you know, we had been planning... Um, a way forward if we did have more cases and that's why we've been able to move so quickly probably half a day quicker than the the previous outbreak but i, I understand your concern it's it's not an exact science but because this is presumably the kent variant and it's so more transmissible you've probably put people in uh, dangerous situations this morning that could have actually made their own choices not to have been in that situation surely well, we put a press release out advising that I would be making a statement and that we would be um, bringing in restrictions from one minute past um, midnight Wednesday morning. So I don't know, Dr. Allenson, if you'd like to come in on the, on the school side of things. Thank you, thank you Chief Minister. I'd, what I'd like to say um, is in terms of schools, we need time to prepare. That's what today is about. It's giving parents the confidence that their child will be looked after, that they will be given choices, and that their child's education will continue through either remote learning or if their child is um, classed as a vulnerable child or a child of a, of a key worker who has to go to, to, to school, um, then, then, then obviously a key worker has to go to work, then obviously they'll be looked after. We're also going to be working with the preschool sector in terms of nurseries and childminders to provide this. But it's very important to get this into perspective. We, yes, we do have a small number of cases in the community, but we can react to this in an organised way to make sure that we don't panic, to make sure that we take people along with the decision-making pro process, and also that we look after those children and make sure that their education isn't interrupted. What I tried to do this morning on Manx Radio is make quite clear to those parents who might be anxious about sending their child to school that this wasn't mandatory, that they did have that choice, but some parents would not have that choice because they need that time to prepare, and that's what we will be providing today through the education service. It's also worth pointing out that um, obviously when we had a case with St Mary's School, we took out, we asked the, the year that of the child that had um, sadly caught COVID-19 to, to stay at home. That's what, exactly the same procedure that we've done with Bema Hague. We didn't shut down St Mary's, it carried on, but we asked that year group where the high risk setting was to stay at home whilst we did tests. We've done exactly the same with Bema Hague. Uh, you know, the rest of the school will, will be low risk. But again, Paul, I get your concerns. There's no perfect answer to this. We, we've just done our best based on the past experiences where we know parents have to go to work today to prepare and that children need to get their IT because at the end of the day their education is incredibly important and making sure that they can work from home and have the right tools is, is really important. Your next and, question uh, Paul. Um, yeah but just had that uh, someone's been on to be asking can you clarify about nurseries are they affected on the lockdown do you know? It, it's the same as, as, as last time. Um, Alex do you want to come in and give the detail on the nurseries? So, certainly, Chief Minister, what we've done in the past is work with nurseries and childminders to make sure that spaces are available for vulnerable children and those uh, children of key workers who desperately need um, to go to frontline services and provide uh, things like the health care that, that we all rely upon. We'll be working with those providers during the course of, of today. We'll also be addressing a whole range of other issues that we've the provision of free school meals to ensure that people are looked after during the circuit break lockdown. Thank you, Chief Minister. Okay. Thank you. And my next question is for Dr. Allison. Again, back to the schools. Um, it, we had a lot of comments that why have you picked only that one year when clearly there's transmission of people moving around schools, they go to the wash basins and so on. Plus there was school activities with other schools taking place, um, which got other parents very worried. Uh, anything you want to add to that about these this interaction with other people from other classes and other schools? Certainly. Um, so, certainly. Thank, thank you very much for, for, for that question, Paul. What we've been doing is working very closely with the track and trace system to identify the risk. You're quite right that um, infections can spread amongst schools. But we also know that even with the Kent variant, the transition, transmission rate between child to child is relatively low and certainly not as high as it would be from child to adult. I understand that some of the activities that went, through, went um, on last week in terms of 
um, the interaction with other schools were outdoor activities, and so seen as quite low risk. So what the track and trace system have been doing is trying to quantify that risk so we can react in a proportionate way, we can spend stay preparing for the closure of schools, and we can look after those children, take them through what is, again, quite, quite a difficult process for them and their families in an organised way. But we will keep the safety of those children as our key priority throughout this and act accordingly. So in answer to your question, yes, there is a risk between transmission. That risk has been assessed on track and trace system and is being dealt with on a case-by-case basis to isolate that year group, to make sure the infection hasn't spread, and then to take action accordingly. And just to finish, well, should people pick up their pupils whenever today and take them home if they can in a position to start shielding today rather than wait for the end of the school day? Well, it's not a matter of shielding. What we're trying to do is ask people to stay at home wherever possible from from tonight. I think today, as I said before, is really a time to to prepare for the weeks ahead. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want parents to be coming in and disrupting classes. Teachers are going to be doing a lot of work today to reassure pupils, to actually guide them through this process, to make sure that they're looked after either when they're in the school environment, if they need to come in, um, or when they're at home through remote learning. So I think picking your child up at the end of the, end of the school day as planned or allowing your child to come home as planned is absolutely appropriate. However, what we This is an anxious time for, for parents and, 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 and children. We know that children aren't significantly affected by the virus, although they can contract it. And so if parents want not to send their child to school today, or they want to pick them up early, that's absolutely fine. What we'd ask them to do is work with your head teachers so that this can be done in an organised way. Thank you very much. I think um, we lost a little elements of Dr. Allenson there, but I think the main thrust of the answer was, was clear. And as I would say, last time when we had this situation with St. Mary's School, the, the parents and the pupils and the staff at St. Mary's School handled it absolutely excellently with the contact tracing team, and it, it did go exceptionally well. So I have no doubt that um, the same situation will happen with the support from parents and pupils of Bemahague Year 8, and I wish, th I wish them all well. Next, we have Helen McKenna from Isle of Man Newspapers. Good morning, Helen. More am I. Oh, my Chief Minister, my first question is probably for yourself or the Health Minister. Why does it take so long to legally bring in legislation to impose a circuit breaker? Well, you've got to get all your ducks in a row. That's something that we have in place now. Um, we, we worked on it over the weekend and we were ready to move as quickly as we can do. However, we have to give people time to, uh, to adjust so um, that's what we've done. We've given people today to get their businesses in order, their children's education, equipment in order, so that we can have a successful 21 days with, without people needing to go in and, and maybe cause more problems as a, as a result. So it's, there's an awful lot of incredibly... Um, complex legislation to make sure it's legal and, and can survive legal challenge. We've, we've got a team who have been working flat out o over the weekend and, and today and it will all be ready um, and be brought in place for one minute past uh, midnight. Having said that, the legislation could maybe have been brought in slightly early but it is important that we give people the, the notice today to get on and sort their lives out and, and ready for, for, for this. It's what we've done in the past. This is nothing different, nothing new. Um, so, you know, I don't want to think that this, we, we haven't um, gone into lockdown until tomorrow because of, of the legislation. It's ready. It's purely we're giving the people of the island the chance to prepare. But also, obviously, we're asking them to start social distancing straight away and um, wear, wearing face masks. I know, David, if you want to um, add anything to that. Uh, very briefly, if I may, Chief Minister, it's just to, just to say that legislation is a complex process. It does have to stand up to legal challenge. We have to make sure it's right and the at first time, and that means we have to go through it in detail. Um, legislation can be turned around same day. What was different on Saturday, which is perhaps what you're alluding to, Helen, is, of course, it was quite late in the day. We knew there were events due to start about half five that evening. 
there was absolutely no way on earth with the timing of things that we could have had legislation drafted, approved and in place for half five that evening. It would have at the earliest have been later that evening. So that's why we took the decision. But the chief minister is quite correct at every single time when we've had an outbreak or a cluster, whenever we've had to bring in measures, we have always given people time to prepare. And I think that's very, very important. We've got the messages out there as to what we would like people to do and what we want people to do but immediately. But then we have said to people, you've got that grace period because there are certain people who may decide, for instance, today that because they're going to be locked down for three weeks in a circuit breaker, that they might want to move in with other members of their family for that period to form a household due to mental health issues and so on. We need to give people time to do that. We have done throughout and I think it's the right thing to do. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Your next question, so, Helen. My second question is um, probably aimed at the Chief Minister. How will government ensure that people whose jobs will be put on hold, obviously during lockdown, are sufficiently supported through the circuit breaker? And Doc, Dr Hewitt mentioned before that eventually, obviously, we want to eliminate the... Um, the we'll have to obviously live with the virus. And is there a, a, an alternative, basically, is what, what I'm asking to a circuit breaker? Is there any sort of thoughts into how it can be? I mentioned, the, uh, I think, last week at the last briefing, a watered-down version of lockdown. Obviously, a lot of people's lives are being put on, put on hold. Um, so, basically, will there be an alternative to lockdown in the future? Yeah, well, there's two points. First and foremost, the same financial support, Helen, will be there. It'll be started on Wednesday. The MIRA, the financial support, etc. What was there in the last lockdown will be reintroduced tomorrow, and the Treasury Minister will give, be giving a statement in the House of Keys today about that. But business as usual, from support to people. Now, obviously, had we been in this position, say, in a month's time, when we had vac given the first vaccine to all our vulnerable groups, then obviously there might have been a more watered-down situation, because we've said we're, we're never going to have we're not going going forward to be totally eliminating COVID on the Alamein, which is where we are at this moment in time. We will be moving to living with it, but we're not in that position yet because we're still in the winter period for the hospital, for beds, and we haven't vaccinated enough people in the um, categories where we had. Obviously, maybe in a month's time that would be different, but we have made one significant change to this lockdown, so to, to this circuit break than we did to the circuit break in January, and that is we are allowing outside trades, the building sector, um, the window cleaners, gardeners can carry on working as long as they comply mitigating circumstances, social distancing, not going into people's houses, etc., unless it's an emergency. So this circuit break is slightly different where a significant number of people can continue to work. From So we, we have made subtle well, quite a significant change there because it's outside and it's deemed less of a risk as we now have more people vaccinated. So we will be moving from total elimination to living with it. Sadly, it's probably come a month to two months too soon and we felt that we needed to go back into the circuit break to eliminate it um, and that's the position we're, we're in. But a good, good question, Helen. Thank you very Thank much. You. Next, we have Josh Stokes from ITV Granada. Good morning, Josh. More am I. Morning, Chief Minister. Um, first question to Dr Hewitt, please. Um, in terms of the lockdown being in place for 21 days, it does feel like a short time to regain control of what's happening. Given where we're up to within, with the unexplained cases, what's your initial thoughts on how long we, can, we could continue to see spread in the community now that a lockdown has been implemented? That's really impossible to call. We will continue to see spread, obviously, within household and close contacts. We expect that, and that's what we saw with the cluster. The wider spread is really down to behaviours. This is a virus that spreads overwhelmingly from person to person via droplets. There is some evidence that it may also be spread by aerosol, that's smaller particles that get up into the air and can be recirculated and therefore cause infection at a time when direct contact isn't happening. And there is also theoretical evidence that it might be spread by surface contamination. However, in terms of the overall burden of transmission, it is overwhelmingly the direct contact transmission that drives the numbers. And that is down to people's behaviour. If you don't mix, you won't transmit it, you won't be infected. 
So that's really the message for everybody, that you have to take this seriously. Over and over again, we find, and I know it's a, a common feature that's found just as much in the UK and also in Ireland, is people justify things to themselves. They think, oh, it'll be all right if I just, you know, go into this household, do this, hug that person, whatever. Actually, you might get away with it, but you might not. And if you don't, it's not only you that takes the consequences of that, it's everybody else that you might then go on to interact with and infect. So you stop mixing, you stop transmission. So we have to take that message very, very seriously. Thank you. Just as a supplementary to that, um, I guess the question, the crucial part was, do you think 21 days is long enough to, to control this in a lockdown? It's a good starting period because it is one incubation cycle, which is 14 days, plus a half cycle. Obviously, if we're still seeing cases springing up sporadically, randomly in time and place across the island during those 21 days, we will have to keep re-evaluating as we go through that time period. So we can't guarantee that we will achieve um, a return to... No, low or zero transmission in that time. The key to achieving that is for everybody to actually follow the guidance. And I know, you know, people get weary of this. I think we all understand that. But we do need to take it seriously and not to justify ourselves in breaking the, the restrictions and keep hold of the fact that within a month or two we will be much clearer on the benefit of vaccination and the vaccination program will have been rolled out that much further and so you know we have to hold to the thought that with luck um, this may be the last time we need to go through this process although of course we can't guarantee that thank you thank you Thank you. Um, I have a second question to you, Chief Minister. What communication has the government had with the police when it comes to enforcing these new rules? And is it exactly the same enforcement as the previous lockdown we saw in January? What part will the police play in this new lockdown? Exactly the same. They did a sterling job the last time in the uh, meetings that we have. Obviously, the Minister for Home Affairs and Justice is part of that, and, and he liaises with the Chief Constable and obviously the Chief Secretary and, and the team when they meet to have discussions that the Chief Constable is, is from time to time is part of those actual meetings. So they will be um, fully adverse as to the decision and they will carry on with their um, well-run procedures that they they did in January. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Leanne Cook from 3FM. Good, after good morning, Leanne Moramai. <laughs> Uh, good morning. My first question is for the Health Minister. Um, we've had a question from someone who is classed as clinically vulnerable. Um, previously, when the islands entered lockdown or a circuit break, they've had to shield entirely. They've now had one dose of a coronavirus vaccine. They're just wondering, going forward, will they have to take the same course of action or will it change now they've had a dose? Well, thank you very much, Leanne. That's a very timely question, actually, because if it hadn't come up in the briefing, we would have been putting a press release out anyway. In terms of shielding, we are advising that those that have previously shielded, shield again. That is regardless of whether they've had the vaccine. Now, the reason for that is, is the FST of the vaccine builds up over time. It doesn't, it's not instant the moment you've had a vaccine. So because this has come so early in the day, it's important that those that even have had one or even two doses of vaccine still continue to shield if they're in the shielding category to allow the vaccine to have time to work on their system and to give them the protection that they need. So I know that will be frustrating for many people that yet again they're being asked to shield for the 21 days. Um, we will review that as the process goes along, as the period goes along. But for the moment, regardless of whether people have had the vaccine, we are asking them if they've shielded before to do so again please. And my second question is also for yourself and um, just a question we've had from a member of the public. They're just looking for clarification in regards to Nobles Hospital with visitation, what the current procedures are there. Yeah, so visitation has reverted back to exactly what it was during the previous circuit breaker. So it is essential visitation only. So essential visitation would be for those who were in a very serious condition, end of life. And we are also doing exactly the same. That is what we've recommended for care homes and nursing home settings as well. Because again, although those in a care home setting have overwhelmingly been vaccinated, like we say, the vaccine takes time and the efficacy builds up over time. Unfortunately, this 
has happened, like I say, a bit too early. Um, and we therefore do require those people still to shield and we do need the restrictions on visiting to be in place. OK, thank you. Thanks very much, Leanne. Next, we have Tim Glover from Manx Radio. Good morning, Tim. More am I. Uh, more am I, Chief Minister. Uh, just some of the comments we're, we're getting in here. Little Britain, it's appeared like over the last few days. Yes, but no, but yes, but. Control freakery of Comen with information. People are saying they wanted to make up their own minds. And they're also concerned about mixed messages because while we've been at this conference, government has put a tweet out. We need you to stop all household mixing. This is absolutely key to stopping the spread. And yet we've got the schools and people around the island going about their business to get ready for a lockdown. Well, that, that's standard procedure. Of course, from now where possible, you need to not mix with others and social distancing comes in tomorrow but we're asking where possible if you can start it now but as, as we've said time and time again we need to enable people to get their businesses set up for the circuit break we need school children to be able to get their IT equipment etc ready for this circuit break so that life can go on as smoothly as possible whilst we're having to go through the the circuit break i mean obviously on on saturday we put a message out asking people to not go out because we um we, we had a case that came out of you know out of the blue that we needed to react quickly to so i i think we've been as consistent as possible it's not an exact science dealing with 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 covid and you're waiting for data to come along and that's what we were doing yesterday for example until these two cases came along at um quarter past eight I've, i found out so it's it's a it's a moving feast all the time i'm afraid or maybe dr you might like to expand on the the, the variants that we're, we're dealing with yeah. all the time Th thank you chief minister i think the key issue there and you mentioned i hadn't seen the tweet from government but you mentioned that the tweet said that we want households to stop mixing households are the highest risk environment for transition transmission uh, of COVID-19. Clearly that's one's own household. If you live in a household with somebody who's infected, the chances that you will become infected are very high. Higher in the winter than in the summer because of the issue about people spending time in heated rooms with poor ventilation. If you invite other people into your household, you're effectively putting them into that same high-risk environment. The risk of transmission in school, the risk of transmission in workplaces is far lower. So the tweet was absolutely correct in stressing the importance of stopping the household mixing. I think it's important. So I, I, I challenge you, um, Tim, to name a country that sh shut down instantly without giving any notice to people. Obviously, we're asking people to re be responsible in the lead-in time to um, tonight or first thing in the, in, in the morning. They've got lives to give. They've got their businesses to sort out. Their children have got to be sorted out from an education point of view. But in the, in the interim, whilst they're going about doing all that, if they can try and do the social distancing, the, the, we highly recommend the wearing of, of, of masks and if they can stay at home if there's no need for them to go out then we're asking people to do that now rather than wait until the the, the lead-in time but we realize that the vast majority of people need lead-in time to prepare themselves for a 21 um, day lockdown or circuit breaker uh, which is what this is and uh, as i say this is standard procedure across the world we're not doing anything that's um radically different and, and as I say to try and shut down instantly just just would be a disaster it would cause more problems and probably add to more spread than um, a, a controlled well-measured way forward is what we're looking for that's what we're trying to achieve second question <clears throat> this latest lockdown <clears throat> excuse me came as a result of a steam packet worker um, a lot of fires being directed at the steam packet, but don't you need to look a bit closer to home to cabinet office who will have issued a company direction notice uh, and then 11 months later it's not being complied with, it's found out. Uh, there was an attempt, I think, to sweep it under the carpet somewhat on Sunday, but wasn't someone at cabinet office asleep at the wheel here and does this not need a full and independent inquiry? Yeah, well, I have actually asked the Chief Secretary, Tim, to do a review of the situation so we can learn from it to ensure that it, it doesn't happen again. Um, obviously, it, it has happened. It was a, a genuine misunderstanding with, with, with um, the, the, the steam packet uh, making their English UK um, team follow the rules, but not the Manx team. Um, the key defence 
is not necessarily um, that element. It was the wearing of PPE on board the ship um, to, to stop the transmission between the two crews because obviously the Manx crew never went off. But yes, I have asked the Chief Secretary to have a review so that we can learn from this. We, we should always learn when problems happen uh, and this isn't any, any different. But I think it's, it has been a genuine misunderstanding and yes, we must um, learn from this, but I don't want it to be a witch hunt. Thank you, thank you very much, Tim. And now, last, but um, uh, David, are you wanting to come in? Yeah, it's just one thing there, Chief Minister. I just wanted to challenge Tim. You say the current lockdown, as current lockdown circuit breaker, is due to the steam packet. We don't actually have the evidence of that. The cases that we that have driven the decision are of unknown origin, so we don't know where they've come from. We cannot say definitively that those lines of transmission have come from the steam packet cluster. So I just need to make that absolutely clear. It's important that we don't run away with this and say it's down to the steam packet cluster because we do not have the evidence to be able to say that. Yeah, Very good point, David. It's also the case that if we knew where this... Um, th these two cases had come from, then we might not be standing in front of you today no. saying that we're having to go into a circuit break. It's all about proportionality or, or, of risk. So this is not traced back to Alaman Steam Packet. It could well be someone has come in who's travelled in and hasn't followed the rules. We just do not know at this moment in time. Right, but finally but not least, we have Alex Bell from BBC Isle of Man. Good morning, Alex. More am I. Good morning. Uh, you've said today that the focus remains on elimination. We've known about this cluster for a fortnight now. We've watched as cases grew day by day. Had you intervened earlier on, could this latest lockdown have been avoided? Well, we have a clear policy where obviously we're not going to lock down the island or have a circuit break just for one or two cases. If we know where they've been, where the people have been, if we've been able to um, establish a, a link which we have done on, on, on the previous um, two cases. And if we've then tested all the high-risk contacts of those people and they've all come back as negative, then we know that as far as that risk and what we're aware of hasn't spread around the island. It, it's only very recently that we've then had the additional cases which have tipped the scales. I think Dr Ewart might want to expand on that. Yes, thank you. Um, until Friday and the first of the two unexplained cases, all the other cases were linked very clearly to the transmission chain relating back to the steam packet and the vast majority of them were already in self-isolation so there was no onward transmission risk from those given of course that they were abiding by self-isolation rules which as far as we were aware they were um, there were a couple of cases subsequently located related to a location of interest. Again, those were self-isolated and the transmission chains appeared to be under control because wider testing of people in that venue did not indicate any further spread. None of this can ever be perfect because always there may be people who were in that venue who chose not to come forward for testing for whatever reason and might therefore have potentially been out there spreading. So it's an imperfect science, but nonetheless, we do follow standard principles and protocols for consistency because we know from, well, not just the history of COVID, but all the history of epidemiology and contact tracing that that approach actually does work. So it was only on Friday that we began to see issues that caused us to have wider concern that there may be other branch lines of transmission, if you like, which we hadn't got controlled within the approach and then of course the subsequent emergence of cases over the weekend and yesterday confirmed that and decisions have been made as you you have now heard thank it, you yeah, i suppose it's quite ironic alex that in january and, and december we had two separate cases the first case that we had at the towards the end of december we had under control um, there didn't seem to be any more cases and then we had another outbreak in um, new year's eve in, in into january that clearly was from a totally separate case and but had traveled all over the all, all over the island and had caused us to go into lockdown so at this moment in time we, we may well have two separate cases like we did in january um but obviously we'll be doing more tests to see whether that's the case or not but it's going to be proportionate locking down the island going into a circuit rate has incredible impacts 
on um, people's mental health, not just the economy and, and welfare, etc. So we've got to ensure that we, we don't just do a knee-jerk reaction when we get a case, that we've done our best research to see if we can trace it, if there's a link. It's when we don't feel confident that we know where a case has come from. That's when we really have to move, and that's what happened to us last night. There are now more than 50 cases of COVID on the Isle of Man, though. Can you not see why, to some people, this seems like the situation has been left to get out of control before you've done anything about it? Yeah, well, off those 50 cases, Alex, some of them are travel-related. They're not all down to this cluster. Some of them, the, in fact, a significant proportion of the cases are people who were already in isolation and therefore had not been infecting people around the island. They were high risks to the initial um, cluster and were in, in isolation, so they were not in the community. It's commu unexplained community cases, which is the main um, cause for concern, and, and that's when you make your decisions. We have six, just to put it into context. So that's not a lot, but it's enough to make us change our minds and go into lockdown. We only had two of those late last night that we knew about. So it's not big numbers of the unexplained um, type. Again, Dr. Ewart, could you expand on that? And then maybe David might want to come in as, as well. Yes, that's right. And I've already said this today, but I'll just say it again. The initial two cases had not been out and about very much. So the risk that there was wider dissemination from them was judged to be not high. And then, of course, they and their household contacts were placed in social self-isolation. Um, the subsequent case that emerged on Sunday and the related case amongst the non-household contacts that emerged the following day appeared to have a plausible link. And obviously, we took forward, as usual, the work around locations of interest. And then it was only yesterday evening when we had two further cases which indicated further geographic spread and wider demographics in the nature of the individuals involved in those two cases that made it become more clear that this is about a, man a moorland fire, a peat fire, slow burn under the surface. Um, which obviously needs stronger um, response than just managing the individual cases and contacts. Thank you. And um, it was really just three weeks ago that you appeared, Chief Minister, in the world's press with, with some considerable pride about how the Isle of Man had managed so far. If we emerge from this unscathed or not very scathed in another three weeks, will you be doing the same? Well, I'm always proud of the reaction, you know, throughout this whole pandemic, the way the Great Manx public have responded to this and, and, and followed the advice and, and enjoyed eight months of um, unbroken um, normality on, on, on the island, on, unlike most of the, the, the rest of the world. I've always been proud. I, I would point out that at no time did we go out to the media saying, look at what we've done. It was the media um, came, that came to us. Um, asking to see how we'd done it. It was um, certainly not us um, being complacent. And I said, you know, in all the interviews I've, I've done with the media, look, we're not complacent, it can come back. We've got to follow the rules. So, you know, I can't say what will happen in 21 days' time. Hopefully we will be out of this and, and the UK media will say, well, the other man's done it again. But um, t only time will tell, Alex. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all very much for those questions. Today is all about preparing, giving businesses notice, allowing schools to plan, and allowing everyone to be prepared. As I've said many times before, there is no need to panic. There is no need to buy any more provisions than you need. It is important to think of others, and I know our incredible community will rally around those who need, who need the help most. So today is about getting ready. This is tough. I know it will be hard on families and on our businesses. It will be hard on our health and well-being, and it will be hard on our children. I do believe, though, that if we get this right one more time, if we stamp out once and for all the transmission that has been sitting under the surface for some time from then, where possible, um, for some time now, we, we will be fine. So, where possible, please stay at home. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm sorry that we've had to announce this, but I, I hope you can appreciate that we, we've really had no option. So stay safe, everyone, and we will, of course, give regular updates 
and um, I, I hope to be able to give a briefing tomorrow. Thank you all very much.